Okay, welcome to the fan common session of Synoikis' Digital Classics Summer Semester 2018. Uh, today we have a session about digital papyrology and our guests are uh, Nicola Reggiani from the University of Parma and Maria Vieros from the University of Helsinki. Uh, Nicola and uh, Maria are, have been contributing a lot to uh, Synoikis' Digital Classics uh, in uh, the past years, and so again, they are our guests. And um, uh, last year, uh, they uh, presented sessions uh, with introductions to digital papyrology. Today, uh, we have a different plan in the sense that this session is more a practical session to see how to work with a papyri in a digital environment. And as usual, you have the class outline on GitHub. I have this in front of me with a description of the session. You have readings, you have resources and links. Uh, I want also to point that, um, uh, well, Nicola um, just published two important volumes with the Greuter about digital uh, papyrology. So, and you can find very interesting papers in those books and they are available uh, online. And uh, uh, last week, I think it was uh, June 7 and 8, Maria organized uh, a colloquium in Helsinki about uh, um, digital grammar of Greek documentary papyri, and which is the first uh, uh, event, uh, the first colloquium of uh, these new projects he, he's leading for Papi, Papi Greek. So, as you can see, um, there are many things happening now about the digital papyrology. Well, Nicola, Maria, welcome back <laughs> to thank you. and thank you again uh, for your uh, contribution. I think that Nicola uh, is going to start. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Monica, for uh, hosting me again in, uh, in your classes. And uh, I know that you, you don't see my face uh, due to a technical issue, but I will, I will show you something on my screen, so that's not uh, really a problem. Uh, I hope uh, all of you are seeing uh, the papyri.info homepage on, uh, yes, on, your, on your windows, on your Hangout windows, because my, my task for this uh, class is uh, to introduce, uh, uh, to introduce uh, the actual practice uh, of uh, encoding, of digitally encoding uh, papyrus texts uh, in uh, the database, in the papyrological database, uh, which is uh, papyri.info. Uh, so the the URL of the databank is the same as uh, its uh, title, uh, which means uh, that if you type uh, papyri.info in your browser windows, you will uh, you'll get uh, this uh, home page where you have uh, uh, two, uh, two main options. One is uh, to search uh, the navigator for uh, papyrus texts, and uh, the other one is uh, to contribute content, uh, which is uh, the, the, practical, uh, the practical side of, uh, of digital papyrology, uh, in a sense. And uh, uh, what I wanted to show you today is, uh, uh, are the three uh, different cases uh, in which uh, a, a papyrologist, a digital papyrologist, can uh, can meet with while uh, encoding digital papyri. Uh, that is uh, one uh, correcting or updating an uh, already uh, encoded text, an already existing text in the database. The second one is uh, how to uh, digitally encoding uh, um, um, a, a printed edition, a printed, uh, a printed uh, papyrological edition. And uh, uh, the third uh, uh, focus of my, uh, of my intervention will be uh, the uh, somewhat uh, more complicated issue of uh, encoding literary papyri, because uh, papyri.info is basically designed to host uh, documentary papyri, uh, 
uh, it's been uh, uh, expanded uh, uh, just uh, very recently uh, to consider also literary papyri, but this uh, arose some uh, methodological and technical issues. Uh, and uh, so encoding a literary papyrus can be sometimes different than encoding a, a documentary papyrus. But uh, first of all, first case, you have uh, a, a papyrus text uh, encoded uh, in the databank, uh, and uh, you discover that uh, the text uh, that you have uh, in your databank uh, is not 100% uh, uh, correct, it's not updated. You want to uh, make a correction or an update to this text. The, uh, the nice thing is that uh, papyri.info is a collaborative platform, which means that everyone, everyone who wants can log in the system and can contribute content to the databank. The, uh, the registration to the platform is uh, quite uh, easy because uh, uh, now I, I can show I, I'm already logged in with my with my personal account. But uh, when you uh, when you reach uh, the home page of the uh, of the databank, you will see here uh, in the top right of the screen this uh, sign in link. Uh, which you can uh, select and then uh, you can uh, you see you can sign in using uh, uh, an already existing account of yours which means that if you owe a google account a facebook account an amazon account a yahoo account or a twitter account you can use uh, any of them to uh, automatically log in the system and the system will will recognize you now of course i will log in with my with my personal google account and uh, uh, here you'll have uh, a list of uh, the texts you are working on of course if you are if you are new of the of this platform you will have uh, uh, this home page blank uh, well, uh, first case, I said uh, uh, you want to update uh, an existing text on the database. For example, I have uh, a nice uh, practical case uh, which I discovered uh, during uh, my last classes of uh, papyrology. This text, in particular, this text uh, is uh, a mummy label, a wooden label which was uh, uh, applied to, to a mummy, to an ancient mummy, to identify it. Uh, uh, its uh, papyrological identifier is a Sammelbuch, volume 1, number 3442. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, you, can, uh, you can see also uh, here the uh, URL address uh, uh, of the uh, of the of the of this record uh, on the databank. Uh, it's uh, papyri.info slash ddbdp slash sb semicolon one semicolon three four four two. And this is the papyri.info record of this mummy label. And uh, this is the transcription uh, made by the first editor, which has been already encoded in the platform. And uh, I will show you uh, in a minute how uh, the uh, actual uh, encoding process takes place. But uh, I want uh, to point your attention uh, right now to uh, a couple of features of this text. First of all, here, first of all, uh, the text is uh, written uh, on both sides of this uh, wooden tag, of this wooden label, the recto and the verso. And so you have this uh, distinction here in the text, and uh, in both uh, uh, sides uh, there are some uh, uh, spelling uh, mistakes uh, made by the ancient scribes. Uh, they are uh, noted by the editor like that. You have uh, written uh, on the, in the recto eta fiaste, which is uh, the, uh, the Greek word for mummifier. Uh, it was the 
the, the label the label meant uh, to uh, to be a sort of uh, uh, delivery ticket which said uh, this mummy this mummy silvanon is uh, silvanus is the, the the name of the dead uh, uh, must be delivered to panisas the mummifier the embalmer so panisatis enta fiaste and uh, it seems from uh, this uh, from this edition that uh, the uh, the scribe the ancient scribe wrote eta fiaste instead and you can you can find the correct reading of the word here in the apparatus instead of enta fiaste so forgetting one new one letter here okay then he uh, made uh, two more mistakes two more spelling mistakes uh, in the verso of the label and uh, that is uh, is instead of ace this is of course a common uh, phenomenon of uh, iotacism in, uh, in ancient greek uh, and here again with the same word in tafiaste he seemed to have written an extra tau hmm? Etnta fiaste instead of enta fiaste. So this is the the, the state of of the uh, of the first uh, digital transcription of the text, which was of course uh, taken from its uh, printed editions. Now, if you happen to uh, click here uh, towards the top of the page, you have a link uh, which is labeled images. And uh, uh, this link will direct you to the Berlin Papyrological Database, where you can find uh, digital pictures of this mummy label. And if you open these pictures, like this, uh, you will discover that actually the ancient scribe did not commit any mistake in writing the word Enta fiaste, neither on the recto nor in the verso. Uh, I don't know if on your screens this is uh, clear enough, but uh, here, this is the recto of the label. Here you can read quite easily epsilon, nu, tau, alpha, phi, etc. So enta fiaste is uh, spelled out correctly. And uh, the same. Uh, the same thing occurs on the verso. This is the, the other picture, the picture of the verso. And here you have the word starting here at the end of the line, epsilon, nu, tau, alpha, and so on. So in tafiaste on the verso as well. So I don't know what happened here in the in the transcription of this text, but uh, it seems quite clear to me that uh, the word is uh, spelled correctly, uh, both on the recto and on the verso. So I want to fix this uh, uh, this thing, and I want to uh, to 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 update this uh, digital uh, edition of the text. So uh, what I have to do is just to go uh, to the top of uh, of the papyri.info record. Click here, the link uh, open in editor, and uh, this will open uh, the, uh, the code, the, uh, the digital code, which lies behind this, uh, uh, this uh, database record. Um, now I will spend a few words to describe how, uh, how papyrus texts are uh, encoded in this databank they basically are encoded as uh, XML files. This uh, has been uh, already uh, probably said uh, many times uh, during uh, these uh, digital classes, I, I suppose, but uh, uh, the underlying code of these uh, uh, papyrus records is an XML file compliant with uh, TEI Epidoc standards and uh, where the text is uh, uh, encoded like this uh, with uh, a uh, series of uh, um, XML epidoc tags which are meant to uh, point to the uh, different and various 
papyrological features of our texts. For the sake of papyrological use, because not all the papyrologists can manage, can handle such a complex code as XML and Epidoc, a sort of, uh, um, of uh, interme intermediate uh, interface has been developed by the, the creators of this databank, where one can encode the text in a much easier way than typing long and complicated XML uh, strings. And uh, this uh, easier way of encoding uh, uh, papyrus text is called Leiden Plus. Leiden Plus is basically a markup language. Uh, it's, uh, it works more or less uh, like uh, XML, which means that you tag uh, words or uh, letter groups in order to describe uh, and encode papyrological features of the text. But uh, it's uh, much easier for the papyrologists uh, to use because uh, it's uh, very, very similar to the uh, Leiden conventions, uh, which are universally used for uh, transcribing and uh, editing uh, ancient documents uh, in paper editions. In this uh, very, very, uh, very, very uh, quick slide, I, um, I collected a not, a not really complete list, but uh, there are the, the most important uh, Leiden uh, conventions and how they are rendered in this Leiden Plus markup code and you can see that uh, that uh, they are really really very similar in uh, in uh, many cases they are the very same for example uh, supplied lacunas they are uh, transcribed uh, with uh, square brackets just like uh, the uh, leiden conventions uh, sometimes uh, there are some slight changes like here in in the abbreviations in the in the resolved abbreviations uh, where you have to add an extra couple of brackets mm, to to contain the whole words because of uh, uh, technical requirements of uh, of the platform and so on and uh, you have here a very quick uh, a very quick um, list uh, of the main uh, leiden and Leiden plus convention. So this uh, this uh, this method is really easier for papyrologists to encode uh, digital papyrus text. So uh, coming back uh, to our uh, editing window, which uh, opens when you click on uh, on that link, uh, which I showed to you, you uh, will have this uh, nice uh, editing window with uh, the text encoded in Leiden Plus markup code. Uh, you can recognize, of course, the Greek words, and you can recognize also the Leiden Plus conventions. For example, here, the word Panon, uh, which points to uh, the ancient city of uh, Panopolis, or Panonpolis. You see that uh, the original word is abbreviated in the text. Uh, in the label, it's written just P alpha. And so here the abbreviation is resolved like that, Panon. Uh, sorry, it's written P alpha uh, nu omega in, uh, in the main text. And uh, the abbreviation is resolved uh, like this. So uh, with this uh, double set of uh, brackets uh, according to the Leiden Plus uh, uh, rules. Uh, when you want uh, to uh, encode such texts uh, and uh, uh, you don't know or you don't remember uh, which uh, uh, tag, which Leiden Plus tag you should use, uh, you don't have to worry because uh, the uh, developers of the platform provided us uh, with a very, very helpful uh, uh, menu here, this, uh, gray, uh, this gray menu here, where you can select uh, all the uh, different cases of uh, uh, Leiden Plus uh, markup 
which will be directly applied to your text. So uh, if you don't remember or if you don't know how to encode the papyrological features like uh, supplements or uh, lacunas or uncertain characters or illegible lines or uh, scribal deletions or um, and so on, you can effectively uh, make use of this uh, help menu. And here in the link to Leiden Plus help, you can even open the entire Leiden Plus documentation where you have a list of all the possible cases with uh, explanations and examples and so on. This is a really, really helpful uh, documentation uh, to use uh, this data bank. Coming back to our example, now I want uh, to fix uh, to fix uh, uh, this uh, this uh, editorial mistake, so to say, in our uh, in our digital text. So I go uh, to the lines where uh, my words uh, occur. Sorry, Nicola. Sorry, there is a note uh, in the chat by Gabby oh. mentioning that there is an error in the Leiden Plus. Uh -huh. Uh, now, yeah, sorry, okay, now I see, yes, uh, to the first abbreviation, yes, probably, probably you mean that uh, uh, the word, uh, the, the abbreviation is, uh, is, uh, is marked only for these letters and not for the entire word, like here? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's uh, that. That was another another uh, slight uh, uh, encoding mistake. This is probably an encoding mistake. While uh, the the other the other the other thing uh, is uh, probably an editorial mistake. I really don't know how uh, it was possible, but uh, because the reading the reading of the label is quite clear. But yes. So we can also. Fix. Yes, this uh, this uh, this mistake is uh, uh, is that uh, uh, the entire word, the entire abbreviated word, should be included in this uh, uh, extra set of uh, uh, of uh, round brackets here. So the the digital editor made uh, made a mistake. Okay. Yes. So it's uh, it's Gabriel's fault. Okay. Great. <laughs> And uh, well, uh, yes, this is uh, uh, due to the automatic uh, conversion, of course, of this uh, of this word. And uh, uh, the entire word must be uh, must be included uh, in uh, in the round brackets. So, like that. I hope I hope I, I did it correctly. Uh, yes, it should work. I think. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, here, here the uh, the the alleged uh, scribal uh, mistake was uh, uh, was encoded like uh, two uh, regularizations. So this is uh, the uh, Leiden Plus code, which uh, tells uh, the platform to display to encode, of course, uh, uh, such uh, spelling uh, uh, variations uh, or spelling mistakes and uh, uh, tells uh, the, uh, the platform to display them like this uh, with, the original, with the original spelling in the text and with the corrected spelling in the apparatus. This is the Leiden Plus way of dealing with this. You have a, a regularization tag where you write the original spelling on the right and the corrected spelling on the left. Uh, you find this again uh, in, the, in the Leiden Plus help and uh, in the documentation and here the same way. Now what I want to do is uh, to get rid of this uh, regularization tag because uh, it's not uh, papyrologically correct. So I just, uh, in this case, I just uh, have to get rid of the uh, this uh, regularization tag. This is quite a simple, very simple task, and I leave uh, I leave the just the uh, the correct spelling of the word as it appears in the text of the label. 
Then I do the same thing here. Here, of course, uh, the, uh, the thing uh, is uh, complicated by the fact that the word uh, is broken between two lines, but, uh, uh, and this is, uh, this is the way in which uh, this uh, fact uh, is dealt with by Leiden plus uh, tags. Uh, if you have to regularize a word which is broken between two or more lines, you have to uh, to reproduce the line break uh, in uh, in uh, also in uh, in the second part uh, of your of your regularization tag. But here again, I have just uh, to get rid of uh, this uh, uh, set of uh, Leiden plus tags, and here is my uh, my text. I leave, of course, uh, this uh, regularization because I checked and uh, in the verso of the label, the uh, preposition ace is actually written is by the ancient scribe. So this uh, regularization is correct. And so I, I can leave it uh, like that. Uh, this, uh, this thing, this other thing that you see here, is just the indication of recto and verso. As I, uh, as I showed you earlier, uh, this label is written on both uh, recto and verso of the wooden tag. And uh, this uh, is uh, displayed like this, very similar to, to printed editions. And this is the way in which uh, this, uh, uh, this information is dealt with by Leiden Plus by Leiden plus markup, uh, you have to indicate uh, the uh, the division, the text, uh, the text division like this. Mm -hmm. This uh, this applies uh, with uh, recto and verso. This applies uh, also with other text uh, divisions uh, in our uh, papyrus documents uh, like uh, columns uh, or a different sides of a codex uh, and so on. This is the all the same. And uh, now I have uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, corrected text. And now I uh, want to submit this to the uh, editorial board of papyri.info. Uh, the members of uh, papyri.info editorial board will, uh, will uh, evaluate this, uh, my, my corrections, will, uh, will check if uh, everything uh, has uh, been made uh, correctly. And so they will decide uh, if uh, to finalize, uh, to finalize uh, this, uh, this edition so that uh, my updates will appear in, uh, in, uh, in the database or to make further corrections or annotations or uh, anything they, they think uh, better. Uh, I will final. I will finalize my submission from uh, another account. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's the same text as you can see. But uh, since uh, this uh, since this text uh, has been uh, has been updated by a student of mine, I will use uh, her account to to submit uh, to submit the text. But it's uh, it's the very same text. I just have to to apply the uh, the other. The other fix here and everything looks like uh, uh, nice i have also always uh, to save my work here in the editorial window by clicking on this uh, button in the end save and the system will automatically check my markup and uh, if uh, uh, my markup uh, is uh, correct, uh, the system will display this uh, green flag, which uh, uh, says uh, you, uh, you did it right. Uh, otherwise, uh, the system will display a red, flag, a red uh, flag. For example, I <coughs> forget uh, to close this uh, set of brackets which is uh, really a, a very, very bad uh, mistake in Leiden Plus because, uh, because uh, 
uh, every bracket you open must be uh, always closed. And I click uh, on save and you see that the system uh, displays an error here and uh, he says uh, more or less where the error occurred. And so uh, now I come back to the correct version of this and then I save and then my, uh, and this is a, a personal copy of the record for my own uh, personal repository on uh, papyri.info. So this uh, saves uh, my work in my workspace. Now I have to submit it to the editorial board for evaluation. So I go to uh, here, to publication overview in the link here. Before you do this, can I ask you a quick question, Nicola? Yeah. Did you confirm that this these two errors that you found in this edition were were in the SAML book or were they errors only in the Duke data bank? Uh, I didn't I didn't have the occasion to uh, to check uh, the printed edition of the actually because we do not in Parm and uh, I didn't have the occasion to get a PDF copy. So I I don't know I don't know actually if uh, if they if they occur in the XAML book itself or in the original edition of this label or uh, they have been made while digitizing uh, the, the text. Because I only ask because if, if this error was, was created by the Duke data bank mm -hmm. in their digitization of it, then it's probably fine as you're correcting it. Mm -hmm. But if, the, if this error ever occurred in print, before it came to the Duke Data Bank, mm -hmm. I think we want to keep a record of that in the Apparatus Criticus, don't we? So don't yeah. we want to say that, you know, Reggiani in 2018 okay. reads what you're giving here, but the previous editor yeah. read something else and regularized it? Okay. Don't, don't you think that would be better? Uh, uh, so maybe for uh, for the moment I won't uh, submit this uh, to the editorial board. I will show you how to submit it, but I I won't uh, do that because okay. yes, because it's better it's better to check uh, this uh, this fact. Anyway, if this was the case, uh, I would uh, uh, I would uh, uh, have to where is here the other. Okay. Uh, I would have to type, uh, um, if I'm not wrong, something like this. Something like this. Uh, no, actually not the, the other way around. Uh, sorry. Better to do that here because it's easier without the, the word break. <laughs> This uh, should uh, work. Let let me check. Yes, this works. Let me let me check the preview. You can you can always uh, check. Uh, the uh, the the display the final display of what uh, of what you did by clicking here the preview button up there and uh, yes okay uh, by applying this uh, uh, this editorial correction tag which works uh, the basically the same way as the regularization tag here you can encode multiple editorial versions of the of the readings of of your text so in this way i encode that my reading my reading is entafiaste 
while the reading of the uh, first edition was uh, the the wrong the wrong reading and this is uh, uh, it, this is uh, handled by by the by the platform by the preview like this with uh, with my with my reading in the text and then in the apparatus the uh, the reading in uh, in the previous edition now to to finalize that uh, i will have to check if uh, if really this uh, this reading comes from uh, the from the editio princeps uh, rather than from the sammelbuch edition rather than from uh, digitization in the in the earlier duke databank so i won't uh, submit uh, this uh, this uh, this thing uh, for the moment but uh, the way to submit it is to go here to the overview of the record then to briefly describe the reason for the submission so just typing something like this which i already prepared here and saying saying to the to the editorial board to the papyri.info board uh, what i did what i fixed what i updated in in the document and then uh, by submitted by submitting to uh, to the social board and clicking here uh, basically, uh, the other uh, the other two points of my uh, presentation for today are much uh, quicker than this because I I won't uh, I won't show you me uh, typing a, a Greek text uh, anew in uh, in the database. What I wanted to say is that if you want to encode in the database. A papyrus text which uh, which has not been encoded so far and you have the printed edition you can do that basically by doing the very same passages i did for this uh, update by opening the uh, the, the papyrus reference in papyri.info uh, accessing uh, entering the editorial interface and then typing, typing a new, typing the uh, the Greek in a Unicode font, of course, or just copying and pasting from a PDF or from a Word file if you have uh, if you have such uh, sources at your disposal, and uh, you have of course to 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 pay attention to the Leiden plus uh, rules to the Leiden plus conventions but uh, uh, you here have a very very thorough documentation that you can rely on and uh, uh, at the end uh, you can save and you can check if uh, everything goes uh, goes uh, goes right and then you can submit to the editorial board by just saying that you entered a new text in the database from a printed edition. Uh, with, uh, with literary papyri, the thing is basically the same. You have to pay attention to, uh, to more features because for literary papyri, you have to pay attention to uh, layout, uh, to layout features like uh, uh, indention or extension of lines or uh, symbols. Uh, um, which uh, are um, usually not taken uh, into consideration by documentary papyrologists. So in the process of creating uh, a parallel database uh, uh, dedicated to literary papyri, the digital corpus of uh, literary papyri, uh, the uh, Leiden Plus set of uh, markup tags has been significantly uh, uh, enlarged and uh, enhanced and improved to to comprise uh, to comprise uh, much more uh, editorial and uh, papyrological cases and issues. And one uh, one final word about uh, born digital editions of uh, uh, papyrus texts. Uh, born digital edition means that uh, you don't have. Uh, actually a printed edition of your papyrus and you decide to publish it 
to transcribe and publish it uh, directly on this uh, database. This is uh, a, a quite a new editorial practice, uh, which uh, has started uh, in 2013 with the first, uh, with the first born uh, digital edition, which is uh, this one by Nikos Vitinas. And uh, these are basically uh, papyrus texts which are uh, just uh, transcribed in, uh, uh, in printed editions, like this, uh, P. Cornell 34 verso, or like this, uh, P. Gothenburg 54. These are all uh, papyri that were described, that were uh, just described in, uh, in the printed editions. And you can decide to publish them directly online. And uh, uh, by doing that, you can, uh, of course, uh, encode the, the Greek text uh, like this, uh, and like uh, the, these other ones. These are all very recent editions uh, of papyri, which, and these, these editions, of course, appear only in this database, not, uh, in, uh, not in any printed edition. And uh, you can also, in this, you can also, for these uh, special cases, you can also add, as you can see from my screen, uh, some introductory words, just like uh, a, a printed edition of, uh, of the papyrus itself. And you can also add uh, a line by line commentary, line by line notes like this, if you have to note something remarkable in, uh, in the text. This works uh, uh, just like a printed edition. And in your editorial, in your editorial window, which I showed you earlier, you will find here in the top menu a, um, a, a button commentary that can, uh, can help you inserting, you see, add introductory matter. You can type here the introduction to your papyrus and here by clicking, uh, now it doesn't work, but usually if you click uh, on uh, some of these, on uh, any of these lines, uh, a, uh, an editing uh, window, up, uh, probably I have to, to, okay, now nothing, okay, sorry. But uh, you can add by, by clicking uh, line by line, uh, you can add also uh, commentaries and uh, annotations and uh, every reference uh, you want also uh, to the to the text edition and i think that um, i can stop here if you have of course questions or other things at the end uh, but i think that uh, that uh, i can uh, i can stop here for uh, for now okay thank you nicola <clears throat> now i think is maria Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, let me turn the camera on. Hi. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Nicola. And by the way, I just quickly ran to the other room and fetched the Sammelbuch and I checked the text. So the r sort of wrong spellings are there in the Sammelbuch, but then there are no apparatus entries there. But in a way, that's probably where where it comes from. Don't know why. Okay. It seems, it seems very clear in the photo. Yeah. Okay. So I, I will I will I will fetch the the Editio Princeps and I will discover what happened. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, now jumping to linguistic annotation of papyri, I will now screen share. Okay, so do you see my screen now? Yes. Good. Okay. So I have first some slides and then I will also go to the practical part. So, um, like Monica said in the introduction, 
in the previous synoikesis classes, we have already discussed uh, digital papyrology. Uh, we have discussed tree banking many times and also tree banking papyri. So I have listed uh, these 2017 and 2018 sessions uh, where you can look back for annotations and then for the basic papyrological sessions last year. So also in the session 16 last year, I was showing the Sematia platform and linguistic annotation. And I also did that this March. So I will partly be doing uh, same things now, but now I'm sort of trying to add some more points of view and more uh, of the from the digital uh, papyrological side of things. But first, uh, some introduction is <laughs> always needed. So why should we uh, annotate the papyrological corpus linguistically? Well, if we are interested in, in the uh, development of Greek language, the papyrological corpus offers a direct source and a different type of linguistic source uh, than the literary corpora we do have. So we can get more insights to the historical developments of uh, linguistic forms and linguistic variation and language change from the papyri. So for, for example, socio-historical uh, approaches can really benefit from the papyrological material because there we always get some uh, more information about the context. We have different types of registers present in, in papyri different types of texts so that's the main reason and also because as we see have seen the existing corpus is digitally available in epidoc xml form and also soon we will have the literary and paraliterary papyri too uh, in litpap info which uh, have all also been presented last year but then again, the search possibilities that we have in papyri.info, which are great for the papyrological work, uh, they do not really help linguist, linguists in their uh, endeavors. So the corpus there is not tokenized, lemmatized, or morph morphologically or syntactically annotated. So that was the main uh, driving force for starting these projects now. So I will first, I will go through something that we have available at the moment for linguistic study of, of papyri. Starting from, from tree banking that we have been hearing quite a lot. So the Sematia platform developed here uh, in Helsinki is uh, where, where we want to really start building this tree banked corpus of, of papyri and the platform at the moment what it does is listed there so it pre-processes the text and there we can add uh, metadata, metadata on, on writers and the handwriting so who is actually the writing writer who is the scribal official that sort of things and then uh, we also divide the text there by the handwriting. So each different writer uh, gets, uh, gets a own tree bank. So we can really also work on, on scribes and their influence on the language. And the morphosyntactic annotation is done uh, externally in Persage in Arethusa according to the ancient Greek dependency tree bank guidelines. So we still have a very limited data there, but it's all the time working progress. And the data that is there is downloadable. And there is also a simple search interface in the platform, but for more complex queries, you, you should download the tree banks. And for the future, development of automatic syntactic parsing. This is some, something that is important to keep in mind that this kind of tree-backed 
data, although it seems to be involving quite a lot of manual work, uh, is important for the training material for, for, uh, for uh, developing automatic uh, parsers in the future. So also the quality of the data is important. But at the moment, uh, for example, for morphology, there is uh, the whole corpus of papyri has actually been automatically morphologically parsed by uh, Alec Kersmakers from Leuven. So there's natural language processing uh, tools made, uh, made use for that. And for that, there is now this uh, Trismegistos words um, database, which I will show very quickly. So here, uh, in fact, you can only search for certain lemmas, but it's it, in a way it's of course interesting if you look at, for example, the word, the verb didomi, give, you click it, and then you can you get all sorts of nice uh, diagrams of different forms of this verb, uh, sort of how much of the active uh, is used instead of passive in the uh, papyri, uh, what moods are used from this verb, how much participle, infi participle or infinitive forms have been used. You can also uh, limit this with uh, dating and then you can see all action, the old attestations of this verb in the papyri and you can see their morpho morphological uh, analysis. Uh, here is actually the system that if you think this is wrong you can sort of say this is wrong and, and they will correct the system. Um, <clears throat> I have not been using this so much, so I don't know if, if this has been effective. But then in this Trismegistus words, I mean, there are these morphological analyses, but you can't really search by using those. So, so in, in a way, this is not what I want from from linguistically usable database, but it's it's usable in many different ways. So it's very great to have it. And in fact, the work that this words is based on is also available in GitHub. So if one wants to use the morphological analysis, you can download these texts from Alex GitHub page. So that was one thing. Uh, and then another thing is these uh, orthographical or spelling mistakes, which already features, featured in Nicola's presentation. So because we have these things marked in, in the Epidoc XML, in papyri.info, they can be used for studying the phonological changes of Greek. So there are now two, uh, two tools using these uh, regularizations in the, the Duke Data Bank. I'm sorry, why I... I again lost my mouse, so I'm trying again. Do you still see my screen? Yes, yes, I see. Okay, good. Sorry, I lost my mouse too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, it happens obviously when I go to and use these links. So in fact, what we can do 
now is to go to Trismegistus straight up and see the text irregularities database which uses this uh, method. So here you can search, for example, a type of error, for example, an epsilon written instead of beta. And you can also state some letters before that change or after that change. You can limit it by time here and search. And it gives you a list where an uh, epsilon has been written in the papyrus instead of eta. So the uh, TI found 825 irregular irregularities. So this is uh, one possibility and uh, then we have developed here in Helsinki another similar type of tool. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Well, now we can test if this works in Safari as well. <laughs> so uh, here, if I would want to do the same kind of thing, now we have actually here also the instructions for use. So you can see them for yourself as well, but for replacement of one letter by another, we could use here in the original virus uh, epsilon and eta in the standard. And these arrows, uh, if they are pointed towards the letter itself, make, make it sort of exact. So begins and ends with epsilon, so there is nothing more in this search. Uh, we could also limit this search by time, uh, or we could also do it only in certain uh, series. So if we would like to check uh, only one edition, for example, or a couple of editions, I could check off the out of all of these and then check the one I wanted to look at. But let's take all and see what it gives us. Okay, it gives us 958 entries. So a bit more than the Trismegistus text irregularities database that can be due to many different reasons. So, well, one is that the Paratypa is updated uh, every week. So this, we have probably more up-to-date material here. But then again, uh, I think uh, Trismegistus irregularities database, they have cleaned up their data a bit. We only use a certain algorithm that finds these instances. And there might also be something that is somehow not re relevant, but at least these all seem relevant. And uh, one thing this tool also gives us, it gives us uh, the number of variations, but also all the cases where Epsilon has not been replaced by eta in the standard layer. So we can, this is always something that people ask how many times that is it uh, worthwhile to see where the spelling mistake has been made if we don't know how many times people also wrote the thing correctly. Okay, so this tools, I think it's sort of good to have two different kinds of tools because they can be used in a different ways for, they can also be sort of used for cross-checking uh, if, if there are sort of, uh, um, I'm losing my English words now. If you sort of suspect that something is not right in, in one, then you can check the other. Uh, so they can sort of support each other, these two 
tools and they work uh, in a different way. Okay, now, so let's go back to tree banking. And uh, so there are certain things that need to be done before we can take the text from papyri.info to tree banking phase. As uh, Nicola said, there is the Leiden plus uh, Leiden markup in print editions. So in papyri.info is the TI Epidoc XML markup. And you saw already that that text then is not sort of plain uh, text. And that's not tokenized. There are the tags that intervene with, with the words. So the Sematia tool was developed to get rid of the tags in a way, but also preserving that information that the editors have made. So there are two different layers. The original layer presents only what the original writer wrote and the editorial standard layer gives us also the supplied text, the regularized spellings, and the expanded abbreviations. So there's the uh, article we described this. So our sample text today is um, an Ostrakon from uh, a gar military garrison, Didumoy, in Didumoy. And here we have uh, first the printed uh, screenshots from the printed edition. So it's always when you start annotating the text, it's good to take a look also about on the print edition. There's, uh, if you're lucky, there is the translation and there are also comments that may help in, in the analysis of the text. And there may also be the image. This time this image has been taken uh, from the uh, link provided in the papyri.info. But so this, um, sorry. This uh, letter written by Hergulanius to Petronius, you can see that there is one abbreviation. You already saw how it was marked up in in the papyri.info, there is something that is uh, supplied by the editor, something that the editor did not uh, know how to supply. So it was by the ninth, nth uh, hour of the night, so he could not sort of supply what time of the day this um, thing was happening. So, I have here the steps mentioned for the annotation, but uh, since I will be showing them, I will only leave this here for further, for your reference later on. And I have to mention here, that before we take this text into process, uh, it's good to do some checkups. So if we want our work to be based on an update, up-to-date version, remember the quality data. So as we saw just now, I'm really happy that Nicola had this kind of uh, example that in fact the original edition provided us a sort of spelling mistakes that actually were not there. You have to check uh, whether there are corrections made to the text. So the Berichtigungsliste is one way where papyrologists list all the new readings for old print, old publications. So this is something you should do before you uh, start annotating your text, because it might not be up to date in the papyri.info. Some Berichtigungsliste uh, corrections are already there, but some of them are not. And then it's good also to check sort of small details like punctuation or hand shifts. I just came across with some papyri where the hand shifts were not uh, there in the original edition, even though it was clear that there were different hands writing from the photographs. So in this case, you could first do your uh, 
correction via the paparological editor in the way Nicola just showed. And after that, take the text into Sematia and in Aretusa for annotation. And occasionally there are some typos or missing spaces that uh, lead uh, sort of then clusters maybe two words together, but and these are usually often noticed only after exporting the text. So they can be corrected also in, in Arethusa later on, but it should you should always always suggest addition the correction also to the canonical Duke data bank of documentary papyri. So if we go now to the text. So I will go uh, to first to papyri.info and find our text. So it was uh, Ostrakon from Didymoi here, or did, and uh, it was for three, four. You can find it best this way. And now this is uh, the edition in Papyri.info. How come? Ah, I have the Greek keys. Sorry. <laughs> it was making things only smaller and not bigger. And so here you already saw by Nicola that uh, we have here some metadata that gives us, for example, the subject and the image where I just took the image for the slide as well. And here we have the transcript. transcript. Looks quite similar to the one that we had in the printed edition. And the, for the transcript, the XML code, you can see it from here if you would click this XML here next to transcript. Like Nicola showed, we have here uh, the tags like for the line breaks, for the uh, expansion of the abbreviations here, and all this that uh, breaks up the words. But uh, for Sematia, we need this address of this transcript XML. So I will copy the address line. And then I will go to Sematia. The Sematia platform, you need to sign in also, and we only provide Google sign in. Sorry about that. We should probably have all the options that papyri.info also had, but that has not been our priority now. But anyone with the Google account can sign in. We just need to sort of have some way to identify the contrib contributors. And now I am inside Sematia, and if I want to bring a new text, I will click here on the upper right corner, the button new, and paste the address I just copied in this window, and I will import it to Sematia. Okay, it imported it, but now since there are so many texts already, I will have to find the Didumoi uh, Ostraka. And here we have the 343 text. And by clicking this plus sign with this in front of the text, we have uh, the layers here. So now the original layer, we have first the transcription where we have side by side the different options. You can see also here all the elements of the TEI XML that were in this document that have been treated in some way. So here we have uh, the abbreviation expan expansion tags. 
here we have the regularized and original tags and so on. And here the plain text is the important thing. Um, you can see that the abbreviation Kyrene is here presented as K and then and, and big uh, uh, letter A. So since I said that the original layer only presents what the original ancient writer wrote, uh, we only take what he wrote and then supply uh, this kind of dummy marker for something that uh, was not there. So for the supplements, the dummy marker at the moment is SU, sort of for supplied. So the last letter of this verb was supplied. So these tell us where there is something that is missing, in fact, in the, in the text. And the dummy marker G is for gap. So I will then uh, take this text to the Arethusa platform for annotation. And it happens very simply by clicking this icon and clicking send. And you need to sign in also to proceed. Okay, it said success. I can access my tree bank here. Here it is. And then what I also will do is um, go back and go to the standard layer where now you can see the same transcription here, but the plain text is now taking all the uh, editorial corrections into the text. So now we have the whole verb for the kairain, we have the whole verb for the speudo. The gap dummy marker is here because this was the part where the editor did not know what to supply. So I will then also send this to Aretosa. Okay, now I have uh, the standard layer here. And in the window next to it, I also have the original layer. So I can start annotating. Um, since we are running out of time, I will not be really annotating the text. I will just show you for example, this um, second sentence where we have this word that was uh, not uh, preserved as whole. It's the verb spodo. So if you remember um, the translation, there was uh, So after taking care of the horse, I hasten to you at once. So the speudo, I hasten, is the uh, root of this annotation. It's the predicate. And the morphological annotation of it is not actually subjunctive, it, it's just the present indicative. Now, the difference between the original and standard layers come from these where, where they um, differ. So now here, the speudo, we have the dummy marker there, and of course the 
uh, annotation environment does not know what to do with this kind of work, I could uh, create a new form for it. So I can give the lemma, there's only one letter missing, I'm pretty sur certain that this is uh, This is the verb speudo, and I can also give it the part of speech verb. But then, since the ending is missing, I would need to annotate this sort of only partially. I will use this dotted line for these forms. Since we don't have the actual ending of the verb, uh, I will not give a total I don't give a person for it, I don't give a number for it, I will just say this is just this lemma and this verb. And then I will save it as like this. So in the searches for different verbs, we don't want to label this as a certain form because we don't know what the original writer wrote. It was only our guess that this was spelled or the first person and present indicative. So this, this is the essential thing why we want to annotate these two layers. Um, okay, perhaps I should stop here and then uh, open the question part of of this session. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. And uh, thank you, Nicole and Maria, because this was a, a great session, really a practical session showing how many tools we have to use, but also the library, so <laughs> combining methods and tools. So questions, our time is a bit over, but we uh, can have a few minutes of questions. Okay, we have something in the chat from Anise from Brazil. Maria, if there is a question for you, if you can see the, the chat. Um, uh, thank you, yes. Um, at the moment, we have only built this system for the annotation and not, not, not for anything else, but that's something that could be of course fixed <laughs> I'm, I'm sure yes the question in the chat for those who are on youtube is if because now there is this um, connection between sematia and uh, aretusa for uh, more syntactic annotations but there are other tools uh, in persids like, for example the translation alignment so the idea in the future maybe is the possibility also to to use the alignment editor for textual alignments and translation alignments. Okay, other questions? I have a question just of clarity, if I, if I may, Maria. Um, something that I, I wasn't entirely sure about from what you said. Do you still have your, um, your Paratipa window open? Um, or I mean, the, I can I can ask this in the, um, in, the in the general case, but um, in the example you gave of uh, I think it was where the papyrus had written epsilon, and the editor had regularized that to an eta, which would be the normal the normal form for that the, the normal form in Attic or Koine, whatever we call the normal, um, and then you said it also gave a total number of you know nine million something um, beneath that. Um, is that all the, the complete count of epsilons in the edition that are not correct, that are not correct, sorry, epsilons on the papyrus that are not regularized by the editor to eta, or is this eta's in the papyrus that are not corrected from epsilon? Do you see what I mean? Um, the but first. Not, not corrected to yeah, they're not corrected from epsilon. Yeah. Yes, uh, the first option in my because uh... they would both answer slightly different questions, wouldn't they? Um, how many times did the how many times to describe right eta correctly, 
and how many times did they miswrite compared to how many times they miswrote it epsilon and how many times did describe write epsilon when they meant epsilon as opposed to how many times did they write epsilon when they meant eta? They're two, two slightly different questions. Yes, yeah, I think since the uh, question here is the replacement of epsilon uh, in the original by the editor to eta, mm -hmm. and then then the count gives 958 variations, and then it this below figure 11, well, million, million, one million something unchanged. So it means that there are that many epsilons that have not been regularized to eta. Right. Because I can, I can, my instinct, my instinct is that a linguist would be more interested in the second option. Yeah, well, this was just yeah. sort of quickly get the, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I will, I will, I mean, with, with first, the first of all, I need to, yes. first of all, I need to check, uh, check from Eric, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what it actually is, yeah. that was my, my, uh, idea what it is and then um, I mean, whether, with epsilon and eta have sort of yeah. different kinds of uh, counts there sure because yeah. Yeah. with more complicated so epsilon and eta are maybe obvious because there's millions of each and we don't you know we know that there must be lots and lots of them but if it was you know how many times is s thy written when we mean r thy that then it does matter. We want to know how many times did they in the sixth century write asti correctly, and how many times did they miswrite it as asti would be, you know, would be the the interesting statistics. So that would be the the opposite statistic. Then. Yeah, but then you can do the search just in the opposite way as well, and then <laughs> um, it gives you both counts. I guess I think if I understand what you mean. Possibly, I don't, I don't know Paratipa well enough. I'll have to try it. Yeah. Thank, thanks anyway, that's, that's useful. Okay, thank you very much. So, I don't know if there are other questions. No questions. Our time is over now, <laughs> unfortunately. We have to leave. So, uh, thank you again. It was great. We need more practical sessions for synoikesis to work together. <laughs> and in this case, we have the tools and again. Papyrologists really are pioneers because, again, it's a small community, but they have been developing great tools in uh, these years. And uh, the work done in Helsinki is uh, a great recent example. So, Nicola, Maria, thank you very much. We will see you again next week for another session about another topic, 3D modeling. I will be in London. Um, for taking pictures of the Rosetta Stone at the British Museum, if everything works, <laughs> I will present some results in two weeks, hopefully. But but anyway, next week from London, uh, 3D modeling. So thank you again. See you and good night. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye.